Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining the inaugural John McCarthy International AI Summer School, which is a joint event with Microsoft and the ADAPT Research Center looking at AI for sustainable societies. Uh, we're delighted to see such a strong and good attendance uh, here today. Um, as you know, ADAPT is a large scale AI focused world class research center with an emphasis on human centric AI, society and sustainability. ADAPT is currently active in a number of application areas around health related issues surrounding COVID and to the wider health ecosystem around data, AI ethics and governance. Today you'll hear from two of the ADAPT Centre uh, speakers, uh, Professor John Kelleher and Dr. Hatem Affley. Um, we're also delighted to have Microsoft um, involved in our AI Summer School. And as you know, Microsoft has been researching sustainability for some time um, in in air and is carbon neutral across the world since 2012 and commits to being carbon negative by 2030. Microsoft is currently researching what are the practical uses of AI in teaching and learning and we'll hear more from one of their key um, individuals, Max Bowell from Microsoft Seattle later. With regards to the RDI Hub, the RDI Hub is a not for profit partnership between Fexico, the Institute of Technology Chile and Kerry County Council. We help both indigenous and international startups and corporates scale their business through design led innovation, fostering and helping companies and individuals to foster a growth mindset, nurturing into entrepreneurs and also facilitating research and training in the technology sector. Uh, we are also funded through the Enterprise Ireland Regional Enterprise uh, Development Fund. Uh, we officially opened in February and we already have um, some very good membership with um, a global digital VAT uh, compliance company Taximo and equipment manufacturer Libar among our members. Our the IHOP community continues to grow and we hope to double in size the number of people that are on site in the RDI hub before the end of the year, but also virtually um, start building our community beyond Kilorgan. And today is a great example of doing that and tomorrow in the, in, in the International AI Summer School. As I said, one of the key pillars of the RDI hub is to connect industry and academia to support collaborative research to solve real world problems. Uh, the RDI hub building in Kilorgan is dedicated to John McCarthy as a tribute to the Stanford Prof University computer scientist. Um, as you may or may not know, McCarthy was one of the founders of the discipline of artificial intelligence and his father was born locally uh, in Cremon near Kilorgan in Kerry. In the late 1950s, uh, John McCarthy invented Lisp, uh, which became the programming language of choice for AI applications. John McCarthy was the founder, the co-founder of the MIT AI Lab and also the founder of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. Within the RDI Hub, we're continuing the tradition of John McCarthy with a strong focus on AI and machine learning. And little did John McCarthy's dad know when he was leaving Kilorgan that today we would be having uh, as a summer school looking at human centered at applications and how we would bring that forward. I'm really looking forward and excited about the next two days to virtually listen to the eight international professors and industry experts discussing AI for sustainable societies. I think today today we're going to hear um, from around the environmental cost of AI. You know, what is the trade off between accuracy and efficiency with Professor John Kelleher from Technological University Dublin. We're also going to hear about sustainable agriculture and he get some really very interesting insights around crop yields and the intelligent farm vehicle for, for to mention just a few issues from Professor Joseph Walsh from IT Tralee. Later today we'll also hear how show, some we'll get some we'll also hear from Dr. Haytham Alfley from Cork IT where he'll showcase real world applications for AI in health, social science and agri-tech and then we'll wrap up today uh, with, with Max Bowell from Microsoft Seattle um, talking to us about how AI is currently being used in education and he's got a very catchy title around how AI can go from science fiction to the science classroom. So that's not one to be missed. Um, I'm not going to say much more. I encourage as much audience engagement as possible. Um, at the start of each webinar, we're going to have a, a Minty poll which will give you the opportunity to engage and, and, uh, in, in the questions that we ask. We'll also leave time at the end of each webinar for Q&A, so you have the opportunity to lean in and engage and ask the, the presenters any questions. Um, I would finish by saying this is just the start, hopefully, of something really momentous. You know, this is our inaugural John McCarthy AI Summer School 
Um, we expect this is going to become a real calendar event um, for the AI discussion in Ireland and internationally, with the next year's event, hopefully, um, God willing and COVID willing, being a, being a mixed event where we'll have a physical event in Killorg and in Kerry, which is an amazing, beautiful spot. And then we'll also have a virtual event online. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to your, your MC for the next two days, uh, Radian O'Connor, who's our RDI Hub member and community manager, uh, to, to introduce the first session. And I really hope you enjoy and, as I said, engage and get a lot from our summer school over the next two days. Thank you. Hello all and thank you Liam. How are you all doing? Uh, welcome everybody. I am Radine O'Connor. I am the Community and Members Manager in RDI Hub here in, in, in Kerry. I am your host for the next two days and we're delighted to have you all here today. As always, we wish to hear from you, the audience. So if you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A function down the bottom. And please note that uh, if you want to know, be known who's asking the questions, so if you want to be say who you are, just put your name at the start of your question and then address your question to one of the presenters so we can direct it to them. OK, so today the hashtag, if you want to follow us live, is hashtag AISS, so feel free to tweet, all that kind of stuff. These sessions are going to be recorded. Our first speaker of the day, and I'm delighted to announce, is Professor John Kelleher. I'm sure some of you already know him. He's uh, coming from the Technological University in Dublin. He's co-principal at the ADAPT Research Centre. He's authored four books. Very impressive guy. Um, so he's going to talk today about the environmental impact of AI. And John sent me a question to pose to you, the audience, before we kick it off. So I'm going to do exactly that. So a little bit of audience participation before we start. So to do this, you simply take out your phone and you go to menti.com. I'm sure loads of you have done this before, so it's www.menti.com and you put in the code 81333319. And it's a simple question. And I feel, knowing John, it's probably a trick question. So which has a bigger environmental impact? A flight to San Francisco or training a face recognition system? So that's a simple yes or no or, or one or the other answer. So I'm going to give you a few minutes and I'll leave this up here just so you can follow the steps. Okay, so we're starting to get some answers in, which is great. So, okay, 50-50, always interesting. I am pretty sure that Jan will reveal all during his presentation. Um, okay, training recognition system, still 50-50. We have a split audience. Okay, it's neck and neck, John. You're going to have to put us all out of our misery during your session. Much, much is in it. OK, I think we're starting to see a winner. Yeah, training a face recognition system seems to be winning at the moment. Um, yeah. If it was a Grand National, yeah, we'd have a very clear winner. OK, given time. I might wrap it there. Yeah, and I think. I'm going to say training a, a face recognition system. Ooh, it's just neck and neck. OK, we'll we'll pause it there and we'll refer to John for uh, full answers. OK, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor John D. Kelleher uh, to speak to you today around the environmental cost of AI. Hello everybody, um, so I'm delighted to have this opportunity to present to you today uh, and thank you for your time and attending the session and the title of the my talk today is Beyond Accuracy, the Environmental Cost of AI. 
And my goal in this talk is not so much to report work that we've done, uh, but more to ask you to reflect on the challenges, the environmental challenges around AI and highlight the potential for future research in this space. So I'm from the Technological University of Dublin and I'm a OPI at the ADAPT Research Centre. So um, I'm going to start the talk by doing a brief review of modern AI going back from 2010, the last 10 years. As um, you may be aware, uh, AI is a diverse field with a range of different approaches to the overall challenge of creating AI systems and even different conceptualizations of intelligence. But in the last 10 years, a particular area in AI has come to dominate, and that's machine learning research. And more particularly, this has been driven by um, research in the area of deep learning. So deep learning is basically um, deals with the training of large uh, neural networks. In particular, they're called deep because of the number of layers. Um, up to around 2010, we typically had what we call shallow networks, uh, where you'd have maybe one or two layers of hidden units. Um, but um, since 2010, we found that going deeper with the networks um, can help us in learning more accurate functions. So this graph here shows uh, a history of neural networks that I, I did up um, that shows some of the major technological events and breakthroughs in the history of neural networks back to the 1940s. And it, this it illustrates that neural networks have been around a long time, going right back at least to the concepts from McCulloch and Pitts in the uh, mid 1940s. Um, and really what happened is that in around 2010, there was a, a number of breakthroughs. Um, some were algorithmic and some were, um, some were hardware based uh, that enabled us to create deep learning models. So um, some of the, the hardware base was, for example, people um, repurposing uh, graphics processing units that were originally created for games um, and using the benefits of those units in terms of speeding up matrix operations uh, in order to enable us to train, um, do more calculations in the training of a network. So um, the, at around the same time as those innovations were coming through in neural networks research, there was also a shift um, in approaches to using larger data sets. So this paper uh, from, I think it's 2009, was a paper from Google, uh, which highlighted the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Um, and the key theme in this paper was that simple models and a lot of data uh, trumped more elaborate models based on less data. Um, and this concept of simpler models where you might make uh, a simple model um, and push a lot of data through has really dominated in the last 10 years. But there's a couple of caveats on how um, to interpret this model, if you like. Um, the first is that excellence, in this case, the idea of one model outperforming another model is solely judged based on the accuracy on a test set. Uh, another aspect is that simple doesn't necessarily mean small. Um, it's more simple in terms of the individual components um, and it doesn't mean that it's easy to understand necessarily. So often these uh, neural networks are black box models in terms of interpretation. And we've seen a rise in very interesting research around explainable AI in the last few years to try and unpack what's going on inside these networks. Okay. Um, that approach, however, of uh, using uh, large data um, fitted well with the improvements in hardware, and with the improvements in algorithms. So that meant that um, we had what you, in, from some perspective, at least from accuracy, uh, you had a virtuous cycle where you had larger data with better algorithms and faster hardware improving the performance of the models. Okay. Um, however, the outcome of this approach has been that um, AI research now has a significant environmental footprint. Um, the faster, the bigger data and the faster hardware use up a lot of energy. Uh, so we've come to the point now where data centers, where we do a lot of cloud computing and a lot of AI research is carried out, currently consume approximately 2% of the electricity worldwide. And this is set to reach up to about 8% by 2030. And in Ireland, AirGrid estimates that data centers um, by 2028, another large tech users, 
will consume about nearly 30% of Ireland's electricity. Now, I'm not arguing here that we should get rid of data centers, but I would like to highlight that we should start thinking about how we can make our AI uh, research more sustainable from this perspective. Um, and with that in mind, I, that's why I want to talk a little bit about uh, thinking about how we can make AI green and environmentally sustainable. So AI is often discussed in terms of how it might be used to help with other environmental problems, but I'd like us to reflect, take some time to reflect on how we can make AI itself better from an environmental perspective. Um, how do we develop a green AI? In order to uh, frame this conversation or to open up this discussion, I'm going to use an example from natural language processing to highlight the impact of um, modern AI techniques. And in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about language models and the current state of the art in language models. The reason I use that uh, this example is because it's my home area of research. Most of my research these days is in this space. Um, so to begin the discussion, I just want to introduce the concept of what a language model is. Um, and in its simplest terms, a language model is a predictive model that's trained to answer the question, what comes next in a sequence? Okay. So for example, if you give a language, a language model is trained, so if you give it a sentence, it will predict the next word in the sequence. Uh, if it was applied to this sentence, to stop COVID-19 spreading, you should wash your hands. Language models are trained to return a probability distribution over the vo over vocabulary of words, where the, vo uh, the probability assigned to each word in the vocabulary describes the likelihood of that word being the next word in the sentence, the unseen word. So for example, this probability distribution, if the model returned it, is saying that the likelihood is that hands is the next word uh, that should occur in the sentence. And that's basically the task of what a language model is. So understood in this way, it's quite a simple uh, model. However, they're incredibly uh, useful as a component in building other systems. For example, neural language models uh, are the major building blocks in your modern neural machine translation systems. So if you use um, any of the online machine translation systems, these days they're nearly all uh, neural machine translation based. There's a switch over in about 2015, 2016 to neural based architectures. And these architectures basically use one language model to take the input sentence in, so known as the encoder, and it evolves a context of the meaning of the input sentence, which is then passed to another language model, which generates uh, the output, the translation. In a sense, it hallucinates that or dreams the translation. And the reason I use those words is because it takes its own predictions, whatever it's predicted as the next word, as the input to the next stage. So you can see that on the output here where life is beautiful, each word that's output is fed back into the system in the decoder. Um, they've also been useful language models in generating source code. We've done some work where we've used language models to generate um, code from natural language descriptions. Again, it's, uh, it's similar in, in its architecture to the machine translation architectures. And they've been used for generating image captions. So these are systems where you uh, present an image to a system and it, it consumes the input image and then generates a, a translation. In this case, uh, what you do to make these types of systems is you replace the encoder language model with a convolutional neural network to process the input image and then take the uh, outputs or the layers from the convolutional network as the input to the language model. Um, now, because of their versatility, language models are a fundamental research challenge in NLP research and uh, deep learning more generally. Consequently, there's been a huge amount of resources have been put into improving language model research over the last decade, and this has resulted in language models becoming much larger and more resource hungry over this period. Um, so this table that you're looking at here, and this was kind of the inspiration for the question we asked at the start to have you think about the environmental cost of AI, uh, positions the training of language models, and you'll see them at the bottom, uh, relative to tasks that are, are normal activities that we are aware of, of having a large CO2 footprint. So the numbers on the right of the table tell you the estimated CO2 emissions in pounds for, the, for an activity. So for example, you can see that tra uh, air travel. So for one passenger to fly from New York to San Francisco, there's an estimated, uh, this costs an estimated 1,984 pounds of CO2 emission for that travel. 
Um, whereas at the bottom, you'll see the cost of some uh, training different types of language models. And you can imagine these translating across to training face recognition systems. Um, transformers are a particular type of architecture um, that has uh, come to the fore in the last few years. Um, and if you include those architectures with a, um, a process called neural architecture search, where you um, rather than define the hyperparameters yourself, you allow the uh, system to search through a hyperparameter space, um, a, a broad, a large hyperparameter space, the cost in emissions can become very large. Um, I know when I first came to this table, I was quite surprised um, just to see, to frame the training of a, an AI system relative to these types of normal uh, human activities that we know are environmentally costly. Um, the chart in this slide um, is showing the growth that has happened in terms of compute in, that has been put into training AI systems back through the 1960s. So um, this goes back to the early training of the perceptrons uh, coming up to AlphaGo zero uh, just before 2020. So the uh, horizontal axis here uh, is time in years, and the vertical axis is the petaflops. So it's a, a, an estimate of the amount of compute. And I'd note that the vertical axis is a log scale, which means that um, small changes in the horizontal represent large differences. Um, and what this chart really highlights is the fact that up to about, while we see a, a consistent growth in uh, the amount of computing cost that's gone into training AI systems, uh, through this period, up to about 2010, this growth was um, in line with Moore's law. It was roughly doubling every two years. However, since just after 2010, it's now doubling every three to four months. Um, so the, the amount of compute and hence the amount of CO2 emissions that are coming out of training these large systems is growing at a rapid rate these days. Um, to give some ideas and to return to the topic of language modeling, to give some ideas of how big these current models are, uh, I'd like to use the example of GPT-3, which was released on the 5th of June, 2020. So very recently, it was released by OpenAI. This is the largest language model that's uh, ever been trained. There's been a lot of interest in it in the, in the last few, uh, since it's come out. This model has one, uh, 175 billion parameters on it. That means the amount of numbers that are adjusted in training this is massive. Um, it was trained on a huge data set of 499 billion tokens. It had uh, the number of so flops are floating point operations. They're a measure of the amount of computing calculation that went into training the architecture. It's a very large number. I'm not even sure what uh, to, to the power of 23 means. Uh, just to, it's huge. Uh, and there's an, or an estimate that it would take 355 years to train this model on a Tesla V100, which is one of the fastest GPUs, commercial GPUs on the market. To put another framing on it, it's estimated that it cost $4.6 million uh, to train this model on a uh, cloud GPUs. And to store the model, it takes 700 gigabytes of memory if you use floating point 32 operations. So, um, I think that you, we can use that as an example of where this kind of big data driven AI has, has brought us to in 2010. So um, to reflect on that, um, we have a challenge that when accuracy is the sole metric of progress, there's an incentive to make ever larger models. So if we just want to make, if we want to create SOTA and if we want to like, get a state of the art system that we can publish, we can uh, one strategy for going about that that has proved very successful in the last 10 years is to make models larger and to put more data into it. Okay, um, The problem with that approach, which is quite dominant uh, over the last while, is that this has a massive environmental impact and we can see that with the CO2 emissions that are reported there um, from that paper and it's unsustainable. But apart from the environmental impact, there's other issues to consider as well. This uh, framework of SOTA being uh, state of the art being based purely on accuracy that incentivizes large models, excludes researchers and ideas that they might have who don't have access to supercomputers. So there's a question of um, access to top quality conferences from researchers from around the world. Another problem with this approach is that it tends to uh, marginalize low resource scenarios, for example, low resource languages. For example, thinking about Irish, 
We mightn't have huge corporate to train models on. Um, uh, so it can be difficult to publish papers on Irish language in the major conferences. Um, there are some shifts around that. Looking to the future, though, um, what I'd like to highlight briefly in my last few slides is just some of the uh, areas that I think we should think about in um, creating a green AI. The first one is the idea of culture. And um, so I'd like to try, uh, it would be really helpful and uh, or healthy for the community, the AI research community, to shift its culture to consider other factors beyond just accuracy on a data set. In order to support that shift in culture, we need to think about the metrics we use to evaluate systems. We also need to uh, start thinking about how we can make algorithms more efficient. And also, I believe we need to think more when we're doing AI research about the hardware we use and whether there's a synergy that can happen between hardware and algorithms. To give some brief pointers in these directions, so when we consider metrics, um, we need to think about how we can measure the um, CO2 emissions uh, of, uh, that uh, came out of training a particular model. There's a range of different types approaches we could use. We might use the electricity usage um, or elapsed time, the number of model parameters or the floating point operations. A challenge here is that we want to find metrics that are stable, uh, both across different locations and labs, because there might be different energy infrastructure at different places, and also that's um, agnostic to the hardware that things are trained on. Um, so at the moment, uh, floating point operations are possibly uh, the best option, but we might want to consider other metrics that we can use. There's links there for some of the some libraries um, that can be used to track the floating point operations coming out and energy usage uh, from your GPUs coming out of um, when you're training a model using a PyTorch or a torch. Another area that's interesting to think about is precision and the precision that we use in our calculations when we're training our networks. Um, so precision is uh, the a measure of the detail in which the quantity is expressed. It's usually in bits or in decimals. So for example, we could express pi to 32 places or to 16 places on rounding. We're all familiar with that concept. But if, uh, just to highlight that the measurement precision that we decide to use in training our networks is connected to the energy cost of a calculation. So I saw some recent uh, work well, 2018. There's some interesting work on using mixed precision in training. The idea here is that we reduce the energy cost associated with training networks by, while we might have a 32 bit uh, precision for the weights in our network, during training, we might do the updates using a 16 precision um, floating point representation. Um, another area that I'd like to, to think about again is whether there is an opportunity for us to consider the synergies between different alternative forms of hardware beyond GPUs and TPUs, for example, field programmable gate arrays or neuromorphic computing. So um, these pieces of these hardware platforms, alternative hardware platforms, um, usually are uh, well have a, a lower energy footprint. And what I'm presenting here is a figure from an interesting group, Deep Learning for Computer Architects, which highlights that there is a, a divergence between machine learning focused research, which is primarily focused on um, accuracy of the models. So accuracy in this graph, prediction error is at the bottom. And if you move to the left of the graph, your model has lower prediction error. So it's becoming more accurate. And power usage is on the vertical axis. So moving down the graph uh, reduces um, the power cost associated with training the model. So uh, the ideal model would have um, would be in the bottom left of the graph and so far as it would have a very low error and very low power consumption. What we're seeing though, if you look at the literature, is that um, these uh, the machine learning focused uh, community tend to be moving to the top left, whereas people who are focused on hardware usage tend to be moving to the bottom, top right. I should say that all of these uh, data points here are different models and they're reported energy and accuracy on um, the MNIST data set. But there, I'd also highlight that there's a log scale on the left. So there's quite a, that that means there's a gap between the machine learning focused research and the hardware focused research. And there's a space in there where we might be able to 
consider that trade-off between accuracy and power and do some novel research in that space that will be particularly relevant um, if we think about IoT and uh, edge computing where the power uh, usage becomes very important. Um, so to conclude, uh, what I'll just to, to review. So I'm framing the paradigm of AI that has gone on from 2010 to 2020 uh, as highlighting it as big data and large energy consumption. And within that context, there's often used the phrase that uh, data is the new oil. But if data is the new oil, then you might consider that AI is the new CO2, uh, the carbon emissions. Some of the things I'd highlight as areas that we might want to consider doing research on to improve the CO2 emissions of green AI, green AI is thinking about the metrics that we need to use to measure those em uh, emissions um, and making ones that are stable and usable across the community and thinking about having them reported in our papers. Uh, things like thinking about the precision we use uh, in our calculations, um, small things like that. It's not a detail, it can affect the energy cost and also considering alternative forms of hardware, such as neuromorphic computing and uh, field programmable gate arrays. There is, however, a, a large amount of work to be done in, for example, porting, uh, if you were to take a deep learning model trained in PyTorch or TensorFlow, it's not straightforward to take that model and port it onto these new forms of hardware. So there's a research space there and thinking about how can we uh, create, for example, compilers to go from a GPU hardware based implementation to uh, more energy efficient implementations. OK, so I'll uh, finish it there. I hope I'm OK on time and uh, I'm very happy to take any questions or to have a dialogue discussion with anybody. Thank you very much. Super, and that was fantastic. Um, I think, John, one of the things that will stay with me from that is if data is the new oil, then AI is the new CO2. I think that's it's something that we'll see potentially on the Twitter feed over the next um, few minutes. But there is some really interesting questions after coming in. Uh, Brett has a question for you. Um, have you considered zero shot learning using language models such as Multifit to support poorly supported languages such as Irish? Uh, yes, so I, I think the idea of uh, zero shot learning and pre training of language models and um, is really is a, is a useful direction to consider uh, going forward. I, um, yeah, that idea of a large pre trained language model and fine tuning towards a particular task or even zero shot learning. Um, I'd like to see more work in that space on understanding <coughs> the trade offs on training these large language models. The idea, at least from environmental yeah, cost. The, uh, the idea of training a large model and then repurposing it to lots of different tasks does have benefits to it. And I'd include that as a, a, a useful way to go forward. Focusing in on the task of um, a low resource domain, <coughs> they can be helpful. Yes, that can be helpful. And more work has to be done there. Yeah, but I think it's a useful suggestion. OK. Um. We have a second question here. Uh, is there an opportunity for better approaches to curating or selecting the data we use to train our AI models rather than training on all available data? And I think that's exactly what you've been saying, John, really, isn't it? So this is the opportunity. Now is the opportunity. Am I right? Yeah, um, so there's work. There is there is an opportunity there. I think that with the idea of pre-training uh, models picking up on the, the last presentation, there's also that idea of active learning, where we use a model to help us select which um, which data to include in our training and trying to minimize the, the data that would be used in training. So getting getting the model um, getting the model trained on a smaller data set is is going to be useful. Um, there are some interesting other thoughts that come to my mind here. I might digress here, but just uh, to keep things going and uh, that they might be useful. There's interesting things in relation to, um, I point people towards research coming out recently on double descent, and there's trade-offs between, which is a little bit surprising, double descent is, a, if you look it up, Google published some stuff on that maybe last year. The idea that the traditional bias variance trade-off um, can break down and that actually, in some instances, more data can be harmful for a model. Um, so the idea of 
curating data and tailoring the size of the data set to the model is really useful. Um, the idea of from active learning of trying to figure out what are the most um, useful samples to use for training is important, particularly if you think about tasks like anomaly detection. Um, and I've seen some work recently on um, important sampling and the idea that uh, if your data is quite noisy, um, how do we handle it? Sometimes more noise helps, sometimes it doesn't. So um, there's, a, there's a, a whole space or slew of areas there that um, I think there's opportunities for future research. And certainly one of them is getting a better understanding of what data we should use and whether we should use all of the data that is available to us or subsamples and if it's subsamples, how do we select those samples? Yeah. Okay, that's actually really interesting. Well, one other thing I'd add as well is that in the, I'm sorry for putting off there, but just a thought there on the data in that when we're thinking about the energy costs of a system, we might want to, we should distinguish in some instances between the energy cost from a training perspective versus the energy cost from an inference perspective. So we can think about the, the models in terms of the amount of data we use, um, the amount of data we, the, the size and the amount of data we use for training and the energy cost there, which the curation of the data would be relevant to. But then on the other side, once we've trained the model, thinking about the energy cost on inference after training when the model's been deployed. So how much does it, what's the energy cost associated with processing one example? So this ties back to the idea of large pre-trained models, because those models, even though they can be repurposed and they don't have to be retrained, you know, once a large pre-trained model like TPT or that has been used, so going back to that question about Irish, you might have a large retrained model that you fine tune to a particular domain. But even though you're not maybe um, continuing to train that model, the, the baseline, it's still, because it's a large model, it still has an energy cost associated with it during the inference phase. So because it's a large model with lots of parameters, just to pass one example through it means all, a lot of those parameters are used or all those activations are used. So there's an energy cost um, after training uh, that we need to consider in terms of deployment. And that would feed into some of the challenges about using pre-trained models. Sorry, I should have mentioned that earlier. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from Trust Paul, with, uh, which is, with the training time of language models being too high, how can this be integrated in interactive visualization, like say in analysis of Twitter data interactively, if this is to be used in sentiment classification? Do you want me to repeat that question, John? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Allow me. yeah. Yeah, so with the training time of language model being too high, how can this be integrated in interactive visualization, like say in analysis or Twitter, um, analysis of Twitter data interactively, if this is to be used for sentiment classification. Okay, so I guess um, I'll uh, I'll speak to that in two ways. So um, one way I'll talk about that is that there's actually we've been doing some work on um, reducing the training costs on language models. I didn't present it today because we only got the notification this morning that it's been accepted. Um, but uh, we've been looking at ways of reducing the cost of uh, training language models by reducing the, or by being smarter on how we set up our hyperparameter search. And that really involves analyzing the data more. In the particular case of, um, in the particular case of language, we have thought, developed new ways of understanding the dependency decay within language. And the reason for this is, so that's how related one word is to another, or how predictable one word is given another word, as the distance between the words gets farther away. So we're often able to predict nearby words, but as a word gets farther away, it becomes more difficult to predict from this and from the observation that we have. Um, but understanding the dependency decay between words can help us in terms of the design of our hyperparameter grid search. So one way of tackling that problem is by improving or, or being smarter on how we train our models. The other way though of the interactive um, visualization of the data and sentiment analysis. I think that could connect with the curation of data and being smart in terms of curation of the data. 
uh, and linking that into the active learning. So I'm not sure if I'm directly speaking to the questions team, but it could be, as I would, my first thoughts on that would be if we can develop smart visualizations in terms of how uh, uh, the introduction of a new sample into the training data would modify the sentiment predictions of the data, of the model, um, then that would be a way of interactively uh, selecting what data to include. In, in the training or the fine tuning of a model. OK, well, I hope that answers your question. We have time for one more question and it's going to be a, a blockchain question. So blockchain is another energy hog. This is coming in from anonymous. So what does AI enabled blockchain energy usage look like? And potentially you might have that off the top of your head, John, but if you do. Yeah, no, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I do know, but I have because it was a while ago when I looked at it, but I do know that blockchain does have a problem with scaling and uh, that it will. So I could imagine, like, broadly speaking, you know, you could think of, I could think of blockchain, reinforcement learning, general adversarial networks. So there's a range of uh, domains that I haven't touched on here, but well, some of these linked to blockchain is separate and what that shared ledger space, but there's the hash function calculation, etc. Um, and but other forms of AI that I haven't spoken about here in particular uh, are other flavors of deep learning and um, that I haven't spoken about here that have a very large environmental cost. And what I would say is that um, I think, yes, that asking the question about blockchain and the environmental cost about blockchain is a really useful thing to do. In all of these spaces, be it blockchain or deep learning, if we can think about the environmental cost and move beyond, for example, for deep learning, the 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 accuracy and blockchain, the privacy protection, and consider uh, multiple objectives in terms of deciding whether a system is good or not. I think that would be a useful way forward. Okay. Um, I actually have two questions that I particularly want answers on, Jan. They're actually really good questions, so I'm going to keep you for a couple of minutes longer. Sorry. Can you mention some research problems in green AI? or at least some research dimensions that's coming in from um, Dr. Anoop. Yeah, so so some of the research problems in, in green AI is one of them would be trying to figure out what are good metrics to use. So how do we connect? So what we really want to understand is what are the CO2 emissions that a particular model requires that is agnostic to, for example, the local energy infrastructure um, or the um, hardware that the, the model is being used on, you know, or the um, particular time sensitive aspects of training. So, for example, if I was using elapsed time for the training to, to try and as a proxy for CO2 emissions, but when I record that there's a lot of other jobs running on the server, the elapsed time for my calculation for, uh, might take longer. Because, of, in fact, that might bring us back to John McCarthy and time sharing, you know. So he invented time sharing and that's, that's been brilliant for us. But um, for a lot of the metrics that we put forward, there are there can be problems or criticisms, and that's true of nearly all metrics, that it may not be getting directly to the, the, the core problem. We want to know for this model and not necessarily for this specific implementation or for this particular or running on this particular computer, for this model, is this the most efficient model um, in terms of CO2 and trying to think about how we can create those metrics that are consistent and easy to use for multiple labs um, would be one challenge. Um, there's also another space that I think is, is useful to think about, and I'm not saying I have clear ideas of the way forward there, but I think there is some interesting work around, there's a thing called the, the, the lottery ticket hypothesis and challenges around um, there's an ongoing discussion these days around the fact that, you know, traditionally we train a small model until convergence and then we'd uh, progress. If that model didn't work, we'd make it larger. But there's some evidence these days about, and that will be a, that might be traditionally coming from statistics. We don't want to over parameterize models because they might overfit. But there's also a lot of evidence these days about making large models and training them for a short time. And this is uh, so. This feeds in, there's a, there's a kind of a discussion between the double descent, uh, a thing called the lottery ticket hypothesis, 
And I saw a, a paper recently that I was going to try and include today, but I was running out of time, about training, a mo training large models initially, and then after you've trained the model, um, then you might, uh, I talked about precision in this, so you can make a large model smaller in two ways. For example, one way is you can change from 32 floating point to 16 floating point, and that, that may not cost you too much in the accuracy of the model. Um, so that's quantization, and that was one way of making the deployed model smaller, which means that the energy efficiency of the model in terms of inference uh, reduces. Uh, but the other one is in terms of um, pruning the model. So once you've trained the large model, going through and seeing what parts of the model you can delete um, and still keep the uh, accuracy up. So there's a, there's a, there's a, I think there's interesting research to be done to understand those dynamics more of how the traditional view of training smaller models for a long time versus a new view which might be emerging of training a large model for a short time and then pruning or compressing the model. Seeing which of those two approaches and understanding those two approaches better will be another area of potential research. That all makes very perfect sense. My last question to you is coming from George and he actually has two questions. So I'll start with the first one because it's quite a lot together. So what do you think, John, of the necessity of inductive biases in neutral architects in the age of big data? So, Should, yeah, I suppose I'll, I'll finish off his question. Then. Should we strive to solve any task with the most generic models we can think of? So I would say um, that's a really interesting question because I think it brings to it brings uh, to the fore a couple of factors. So maybe in the background of that question, if we were sitting down for coffee, I'd be wondering about generic biases and generic models and how that relates to theory free versus theory informed. And when I talk about theory here, I guess there's two different types of theory. There would be computational learning theory versus domain theory. So what I mean here is that if I have strong, let's say I'm doing something in medicine or something like that, and I have a strong domain theory for how the system works, then thinking about the inductive biases of the algorithm, uh, is a, an approach of thinking about how I can, to an, to an extent, bring in domain theory into the model, factor it in. So, for example, convolutional neural networks have, a, you can think of them having the idea of they have a built in bias into them that uh, things that look the same, irrespective of where they are, should be considered the same, as a rough way of putting it. OK, because we, we try to look for spatial invariance there. That's a really useful and inductive bias. Um, and for image classification tasks, that's a very good bias to have, uh, or it seems to be at least. And it reduces factoring in that inductive bias into the model, reduces the cost of training uh, image classifiers um, because we have shared parameters that are tied, etc. So it can be the case that inductive bias that is well informed um, is useful uh, um, in terms of energy and accuracy. So uh, it's not necessarily the case, I think, um, and I, I, I might be drifting from the question there, but I, I, I don't think inductive biases are a problem necessarily, particularly if they're well informed. I would be worried now against sample biases and those aspects, but inductive bias, my own view, maybe it's partly a hidden Bayesian in me or something like that. I don't know the priors, but if you have theory and domain, domain theory, factoring it into the design of your model is a good thing to do. And in some ways that's adding in inductive bias into your model because you're, you're, the way you constrain the search space of the model through your domain theory is taking the, making the, yeah, moving the attention of the bias maybe away from, or the attention of the training process away from just following the data. I'm not sure how coherent that answer was, but hopefully I spoke to the question. George, I hope that answered your question. John, it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, world of knowledge as always, and you have great questions coming in. We didn't get to all of them, but we'll never get to all of them. They were great questions and a big thank you to John. Um, and we'll hope to see you again soon. Sure. Now in 10 minutes, we're going to have Professor Joseph Walsh join us and he's going to talk about uh, AI and uh, sustainable agriculture. So uh, everyone take five minutes, 
get a nice coffee, come back for two and we'll kick off again. Big thank you to you, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.